So, our charter members did what? It's a funny question. Maida chose the title, not me. So I'm going to try to live up to the title. And I'm going to talk about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the 1856 charter, especially because some of you are in the 1856 circle, newly named that. And so you'll have a better sense of what the meaning of that is. And I'm going to talk about the individuals who signed the charter and the accomplishments of the congregation itself between 1854 and 1865. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the founding of the, con the congregation, which is different in some ways from the charter itself. And mainly, I want to give you an idea, as much as it's possible to do when there's often only fragmentary information available, of the community of members who made the commitment to build this congregation. If we had the original charter of incorporation on Road of Shalom, it would be obviously one of the most treasured documents in the archives, but we don't. We have only a photocopied version of the handwritten transcription that was recorded in Charter Book, Volume 1, page 162, and then we have later typed versions, some with amendments to the Constitution. The prologue of the Charter in the handwritten version begins, quote, impressed with the existing necessity for the formation <clears throat> of a German religious society, the undersigned have resolved such an association in Pittsburgh, state of Pennsylvania, which is to be known by the name of Rodef Sholem, and this is spelled R-O-D-E-F-S-C-H-O-L-E-M, and there's a whole talk to be made about the variations in the spelling over time, but we won't go into that tonight. But the important thing to me is that the original transcription in the charter book was done by hand, and it also had the name in Hebrew. Now, when we get into the type versions like this one, there is no Hebrew language in it at all, but I just thought that was interesting. Throughout the document, the word Hebrew is used where we would now use Jew or Jewish, and that was very common at that time. It was signed on November 9th, 1856, but it wasn't presented to the Court of Common Pleas until July 1859, when it was described then as, quote, a society for the promotion of the principles of peace and tolerance and for educational purposes, end quote. After putting a notice of the intended incorporation in a newspaper as required by law for a certain number of days and receiving no objections, the Prothonotary's office then certified the incorporation in October of 1859. Now, the word German in the charter <clears throat> leads us into the earliest history of the various starts at forming a congregation in this city. It's kind of trite to say that um, the truth of the origins of the congregation is shrouded in the mists of history, but that's what we say when we just don't have a grasp on all the facts, and that's absolutely the case here. The first Jewish communal organization established in Pittsburgh clearly was the Best Almond Society, a burial society, which in 1847 bought a plot of land on Troy Hill for a cemetery. It was a pressing need and an ongoing need for any community. Most of the members of that society later were charter members or other very early members of Road of Shalom. By some accounts, the Best Almond Society functioned as a congregation, holding not just funerals, but regular services in homes and rented rooms, but even that's hard to say for sure now. And because the Jewish community here was so small at first, it couldn't support a range of congregations so it strove to find one format and one organization that would please everyone, and of course, it pleased no one at all. I could give you my best shot at pulling all the threads together, but it would probably be a really different story from someone else's attempt to do the same thing. And there just isn't enough clear, authoritative documentation to be sure at this point. Ethnic differences, we know, played a large part in the pulling apart of the first attempts. And there were controversies over prayer books and practices that widened the gulf, particularly between the Germans and the Poles. Our charter members signed this constitution in order to establish a specifically German form of practice. It says so right there. The handwritten version of the charter includes a list of the 24 men, and yes, they were all men, who signed the document. And the same list occurs in the first typed versions perpetuating the same errors of spelling of the names, made perhaps by someone who wasn't familiar with German names. Or, but at that time, um, 
common words were not standardized in spelling yet, so um, variation in proper names would be to be expected anyway. And there were, besides these 24 people, there were definitely other people involved in the formation of the congregation and loyal to it, but they weren't present to sign the charter. And it may be that it was the board and the officers were the ones who signed the charter, but we don't even know that right now. Some of these names have been difficult or impossible to trace back, and two of the 24 I just gave up on. They're um, one initial and a name that I just couldn't match with anything. So I'm gonna talk to you about 22 people. So I'm gonna give you a sketch of what I could find about who these charter members were, what they accomplished as individuals be between 1854 and 1862 when the first Road of Shalom building was built, and a little bit later than that. I'll try to mention, as often as I can, the unnamed charter mothers, shall we call them, though that's even more difficult, as you can imagine, there's less information about the women. My goal was to find a picture, a news clip, or something more than just a tombstone to show you for each family, and I've mostly been successful at that. But first, a little context. These figures will give you a sense of the size of the general population and of of the Jewish community in those early years. I've combined population figures for Pittsburgh and Allegheny City because our charter members lived in both areas. And you can see that the population grew about 10,000 people between 1850 and 1860 for the combined cities. And the pressures to emigrate from Germany, and I'm using the term Germany, the word Germany as a shortcut for people who lived in areas where German was the dominant language, uh, because the, the country of Germany wasn't unified until 1871, so 20 years after we're t what we're talking about. And so the pressures to emigrate from Germany were both political from the 1848-49 revolutions and economic because there was a depression that followed those wars. So there were many German speakers who were arriving in the US looking for a safer life with more opportunities. Similarity with the industrializing areas of Germany made Pittsburgh a draw for all sorts of Germans in the mid-19th century. Even now, in the 21st century, German Americans make up about 20% of Pittsburghers. And Jews, as you can see, were few in number, less than 1% of the total population of the Pittsburgh two cities. Looking at just our group of 22 charter members, what I really want you to notice is their ages. These are not ancient gray beards looking down on us from gilt photographs or portraits in picture frames. These are really, really young men. 55% were in their 30s, nearly 100% under 60, and only one among them over 60, and that one was only 61 which seems pretty young to some of us, you know? So think what you were like in your 30s. Were you ready to be a pioneer homesteader in a frontier town and to start religious and community organizations from scratch while you were busy establishing yourself in business and raising a house full of children? What this small group of young families accomplished is really remarkable. Notice that all of the charter signers were born in German Europe and that most of them lived out the rest of their lives here in Pittsburgh and are buried in our two cemeteries. The list of occupational categories I've put here, and I've grouped them together to make just three big categories, it adds up to more than 100%, because most of these men had more than one occupation in their lifetimes, moving up, say, from shopkeeping to manufacturing as their prosperity increased. And in this grouping, dry goods covers pretty much all retail except groceries and liquor. It includes retail and wholesale, clothing and shoes, notions, jewelry, etc. Half of these men were for at least some of their careers drovers, which is called livestock dealers on this slide. And drover is a word that most people don't even recognize anymore. Well, they ran cattle to the stockyards on Harris Island and in East Liberty. Did you know we had a huge stockyard in East Liberty that was a major connection point for stock all over the eastern seaboard? I had no idea until I started looking into this. So um, our, our members either did that, running the cattle themselves, or they contracted for it to be done, depending on where they were in their organization. 
And they bought and sold cattle, sheep, and wool, not hogs. Jews dealt only with cattle and sheep. They bought and sold in small and large quantities, and they often, as I noticed from the newspaper articles, they often sued each other over the value of something as small as one missing animal. In the smaller occupational categories that don't appear on the slide, there's only one peddler, which is a little bit against stereotype, one pawnbroker, one bookkeeper, one banker, no teachers and no lawyers. The first Jewish lawyer in Pittsburgh was uh, Josiah Cohen in 1866, so um, that's a big landmark. The following slides show what I've found out about each one of the founders in more or less alphabetical order. I've cast a pretty wide net for sources, and yet I'm sure there are family collections out there that I've not had access to. So if you have photos or other information about any of these people, please talk to me about sharing them with me. I don't guarantee the absolute accuracy of any of this information. As you know, if you've ever worked on your own family history, sources conflict, newspapers misrepresent, memories are vague or embellished. There are lots of ways for inaccuracies to creep in. So if it's your family I'm talking about, of course, that matters more to you. So make sure I get your corrections if you're descended from any of these people. First up is Marx Arnold. He, this is the one that was the only one who was over 60. And there's great information about Marx Arnold and his extended family in an article that Eric Legey wrote for the Chronicle that was published, I think, maybe two or three years ago. He uh, talked about the Arnold family as an early harbinger of more immigration to Western Pennsylvania. And they were, like many of our other charter members, uh, Pittsburgh was not the first place they came to in the United States. So this family started out in Carlisle and then moved a little west to Chambersburg. And the ad in this slide shows um, Marks Arnold's store, soon to be available to rent in um, Fayetteville, which is right near Chambersburg, because he and his family were moving to Newcastle next. And then they moved to Pittsburgh. And I guess it was probably because of his age that he might have been, uh, it might have been one of the reasons why he was selected to be the first president of Road of Shalom. Next, William and Paulina Wormser Frank. These are well-known founders of Road of Shalom. We have their portraits in the hall outside the library, on the side facing um, Cohen Chapel. And we have descendants in the congregation still as members. William Frank did very well in business, first in dry goods, and then as a glass manufacturer. And then he bought into an oil refinery, Petrolia Oil Company, and his partners were some of the other founding members of the congregation. William served as the fourth president of Road of Shalom. Pauline was a founder of the women's organizations that were started in the community in the 1850s and she continued a tradition of philanthropy throughout her very long life. Two of their infant children were among the earliest burials at the Troy Hill Cemetery. Now, Paulina outlived everyone else in all the charter families. In her obituary in the Jewish Criterion, she was described in this way, quote, strong in her faith of Judaism, broad-minded and tolerant, progressively modern to a remarkable degree, her labors in behalf of distressed humanity knew neither creed nor color, end quote, which I think is a really remarkable thing to say about anybody in 1910. And an interesting thing about her is that she and Rabbi Levy shared a November 24th birthday, so they sometimes had joint parties for their birthday. Asher Guckenheimer, this is my most colorful slide, and it's kind of the sacred and the profane right next to each other. So on the left is the uh, memorial window that his widow donated to the congregation. It was in the 1901 building on um, 8th Street and then moved here. And it's the Moses window. So when you go into the sanctuary it, uh, by the usual door, it's uh, the far right window. And then on the other hand, uh, on the other side is the label of Guckenheimer's finest, rye whiskey. So, like other people in this list, um, Guckenheimer started out as a drover, and then he moved into town and became a liquor jobber, and he was so successful at that 
that he and his half-brothers, the Wertheimer brothers, founded a company and bought a distillery in Freeport, which is just up the Allegheny River a little bit. And this became one of the largest distilleries and distributors of whiskey in the entire eastern half of the country. Really a big business. His wife was Ida, as I said, and they had 10 children in 19 years, which is also a pretty big business when you think about it. Next, Alexander Greenwald and Isaac Kahn. I don't know much about them except that they were partners in a livestock business. And that Greenwald, for the 1860 census, declared his personal estate to be worth a value of $300. The 1860 census, for one, I'm not sure what the reason is, but um, you were asked for your personal estate value and your any real estate that you owned. And that's not common for other censuses around that time, so it's interesting what information you can get from that. So he said his personal estate was valued at $300, which doesn't sound like very much, but it's the equivalent of about $9,900 today, and he was only 25 at the time, so that's, that's something. Um, oh, actually, he was older than that. He was 25 when he signed the, the charter. Another pair of drovers and partners in a livestock business, Moses Good and Moritz Krauts. I'm sorry, this one is very funerary, just graves and an obituary, but that was all I could find. Um, something to note here is the anglicization of German names. Uh, the last name Gut means good in German, so we just made that good. And I'm not sure what first name he would have used in Germany, but he used Moses and Morris here, depending different times of his life. Maybe in a business context, he used Morris more. And his wife, Babette, was sometimes known as Barbara, but Moses and Babette are what went on their tombstones in Troy Hill. Moses Good, um, for that same 1860 cent, uh, census, gave his personal value as $1,500, which is about $50,000 now. So he was pretty well off. Uh, Moritz Krauss, uh, after retiring from the livestock business, became a jewelry dealer in town. Now, Leopold Heilbrunner was kind of an occupational outlier. He started out in dry goods, like so many other people, but then he shifted to the lumber business. He's the only one of our founders who was involved in lumber. Uh, he, his family had lived in Brookville, Pennsylvania earlier. One of his children was born there. And somehow I think that might be the connection with the lumber business because Brookville was uh, an early center of lumber, um, the whole lumber industry for north central Pennsylvania. It's very unusual to find for that time period an obituary for a wife. Um, you probably can't read it at all, but this one is in German, and maybe you couldn't read it anyway, even if you could see it. I couldn't find what paper was in it, I just found it somewhere on the internet. But I noticed that the bottom line says, Bitte kleine Blumen, no flowers please, for her funeral. And on the right is the gravestone of their son at Troy Hill. He died at the age of five. I couldn't find birth or death information on Louis Hirschfeld, but he was a merchant tailor out early. In, by 1847, he was running a shirt emporium, as he called it, on Smithfield Street downtown. And here in this ad on the slide, you can see he's expanded to all men's furnishings and clothing clo at prices not to be rivaled, it says in the ad. He moved away from Pittsburgh in 1864. Jacob and Lena Klee are pretty well known to a lot of people. Uh, he's another merchant tailor in business with various people, including Simon Kaufman and Morris Falk, and then finally in business with his brother Joseph. This photo was taken shortly after their marriage in 1854, and I just want a little sidebar to say that um, photography, for personal reasons, was just not even a thing in the 1850s. It didn't become popular until the Matthew Brady pictures of the Civil War, and then after the Civil War, pretty much every town had its own photography studio, and people did go in and have their pictures taken so they could send them to their relatives and such. But to have such an early picture of such a gorgeous couple is really quite unusual. Uh, Jacob Feldman, in his book, The Jewish Experience in Western Pennsylvania, described Jacob Klee this way, quote, 
Over six feet in height and with a beard and ruddy cheeks, he was one of the most physically impressive Jews in Pittsburgh, end quote. And uh, Jacob said that when he got here, I think they arrived through the port of New Orleans, if I'm remembering correctly. When they got to Pittsburgh, he found that the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers reminded him of the meeting of the, Mai, the Rhine and the Moselle rivers in, near his hometown in Germany. So he decided, I feel comfortable here. This is where I'm going to stay. They had 10 children. And this is the brother, Joseph Klee, and his wife, Rosa Sanders. Joseph was older than Jacob by two years. He was, in the 1850s, the only Jewish shoemaker in Pittsburgh. But as the ad on the right here shows, he joined up with his brother in manufacturing and selling clothing, and that was his career for the rest of his life. And my thanks to Wendy Wertheimer for helping me find this great family photo. They also had a big family, as you can see. Simon Marks was another drover. He was a partner with uh, Solomon Trowerman, whom you'll find out about later. But in, in this ad, it shows that, that that business was dissolved, that partnership was dissolved, and um, he, Simon became a partner with his own brother, Charles. I don't know very much more about them. Here we have another set of brothers and partners in the livestock business, Joseph and Louis Myers. And in the photo on the left, this, I just wanted to show you there are some remnants of the livestock business and drovers. This is on the north side, a street called Drover's Way. It's still there today. I didn't take the picture, but um, it's still there today. The north side was really the center of that because it was close to both of the stockyard areas. Um, both of these brothers, after they finished their, with their livestock business, they later made it big in the Petrolia Oil Company. They were partners with William Frank and Ephraim Wormser in that. And Joseph was the second president of Road of Sholem. His grandson, by the way, was the playwright George S. Kaufman, who grew up here in Pittsburgh. Both of these brothers moved away from Pittsburgh in the 1870s, one to Chicago and one to Baltimore. Now, this name is transcribed as Willenberger on the charter. So this guy was really hard to find. I had to just finally make the connection that it wasn't really a W, it was an M. So it's Joseph Mittelberger. His wife died at, an, at the age of 45 when they still had young children at home, and she's buried at Troy Hill. Interestingly, he's the only one of these people I've found who registered for the draft for the Civil War. He registered in 1863. And Feldman in his book says the reason there weren't more Jewish soldiers in the Civil War from Pittsburgh is that um, the, the men were too old and their sons were too young. But that's really not true when you look at the ages of these people. They were in their 30s, and there were people in their 50s who served in the Civil War. So I, I'm just a little surprised. Maybe there is evidence that other people did register, but I couldn't find it. Henry Rosenbach started out in dry goods, and then he went on into oil exploration and refining. He served as a third president. He was involved in the merger of Road of Shalom and the Shara Shemayim congregations in 1860. This is part of that misty history that I don't really want to go into, <laughs> the unraveling and reweaving of the different ethnic groups. Rosenbach later moved closer to the oil fields. He lived in Titusville and Oil City, where he belonged to the Reform congregation there. Jacob Rothschild, I know almost nothing about him, except that he was another drover. And these newspaper notices, which you can't see, I just put them up to show you that the newspapers, especially the Pittsburgh commercial newspaper, regularly covered these tiny little things about that, the livestock business. So one of these says, also 13 head of cattle to E. Katz at $6.30 each, one bull to Kaufman for five and a half cents per pound. This is, it was, shows how important that business was in Pittsburgh, that these little details were regularly in the papers. Louis Stern and his brother ran a retail liquor store on Liberty Avenue starting before 1850. Later on, he was also on the board of directors of Park Savings Bank in Allegheny City. And that's what this notice is, a memorial resolution that that board put in the paper when he died. One of his children was one of the first burials at Troy Hill, an infant burial. Meyer String and his brother arrived in the US in 1849. 
he sometimes anglicized his name to Michael, and his brother's name was Moritz, and he anglicized that to Morris. Mike uh, Meyer was a junk dealer first, and then a pawnbroker, and then a bookkeeper, sort of came up in respectability in that way. Now here we have two obituaries. I'm sorry for that, but I couldn't find any pictures for these people, but the obituaries are interesting. Uh, Solomon Trowerman was, as I said before, another cattle dealer, and then he had his own business when his partnership broke up, and then his sons took over the business when he retired. And he's described in his obituary as the second oldest member of Road of Shalom. As I said before, it's unusual to find an obituary for a woman. This one is under her own given name, which is really unusual. And it's from the Israelite, Isaac Meyer Wise's um, paper from Cincinnati. So it shows that she was known outside the Pittsburgh community. He describes Jeanette as, quote, a constant, untiring, and active worker for Gusky Home, Hebrew Ladies Benevolent Society, Pittsburgh Association for the Improvement of the Poor, and other causes, end quote. She died only a little more than a month after her husband's death. Ephraim Wormser was the brother of Pauline Frank, and he was involved with his brother-in-law, William Frank, in both the dry goods and the glass manufacturing business. And he owned by himself an oil refinery in Pittsburgh, which he sold to the Standard Oil Company. I'm sure he made a little bit of a bundle on that deal. He was an outlier in terms of residence. Almost all of these people lived either in downtown Pittsburgh, often over their shop if they ran a store, um, or in Allegheny City. Uh, the Franks lived on Mount Washington for a while, but um, Ephraim Wormser lived in, I think, what's now Hazelwood, in um, what's called the Old Thompson Homestead, above Sylvan Avenue. I looked at it on a map, but I couldn't quite picture where it was. And he's described as the oldest member of Rode of Shalom in his obituary. He died the next year after Trowerman. But in fact, his sister Paulina Frank was two years older than he was, and she didn't die until 1910. But women were just not considered members the way men were. I mean, she was a pillar of this community all her life, but she didn't get that credit. In, in her obituary, I have to say, it does say that she was the oldest person associated with Rode of Shalom. I don't think it even says member then. Listen, we've come to the Z's. This is the last one. Simon and Babette Zugsmith, or Zugschmidt in the German pronunciation. He ran a variety store at the corner of Fifth and Wood downtown, which is a really choice location. And by 1860, he owned real estate. This is not his personal estate, but real estate he owned worth $4,000, or the equivalent of about $132,000 in purchasing power today. He and Babette were married in 1842, and they had eight children. She died at age 43. Exhaustion from <laughs> eight children, maybe? I found this really nice portrait of her on Wendy Hochstetter's online family tree. Well, that's all of the 24, that's 22 that I could identify. It's a lot to take in, but really, it's only snippets of information that I hope will give you the sense that these were real people engaged in demanding and fulfilling lives in their newly adopted city. Again, if you have more information on any of them, please contact me. So going back to the charter now, its first stated purpose was to fulfill the need for a German religious society. In 1854, the congregation had chosen William Armhold as a leader of services and a teacher for the children. He fulfilled these, in, these functions using, I believe, exclusively the German language. He was not an ordained rabbi. In 1858, pretty soon after the charter was signed, Rode of Shalom celebrated his first confirmation for just one student, Hyman Frank, a son of William and Pauline Frank. Four years later, in 1862, the confirmation ceremonies were held for six girls and one boy. And the second stated purpose for the incorporation of Rode of Shalom was, quote, the establishment of a good school in which the young shall be instructed in the principles of the Hebrew religion as well as general branches of knowledge, end quote. They formed the Pittsburgh Hebrew School. Not too many people know about this, but it was the first day school in the Jewish community in Pittsburgh. It began operating in the mid to late 1850s with William Armhold teaching in German and Hebrew and was greatly strengthened by the arrival in 1860 of Josiah Cohen, the young immigrant from England who would later join the bar 
become a judge and serve Rod of Shalom for a long time as president. He taught in English the regular school subjects, reading, spelling, grammar, history, geography, and math. The day school had 32 pupils in 1860 and 90 by January of 1863. It was in operation until 1868. During the 1850s, the foundation was laid for many of the communal organizations that still support the Jewish community today in their new iterations. Philanthropic organizations such as the Hebrew Benevolent Society, founded by the men in 1853, and the Hebrew Ladies' Aid Society, which went by a number of different names, founded by the women in 1855, drew leadership and financial support from the Rod of Shola membership, some of whom were becoming as we've seen, quite well established in business and were able to contribute significantly to the greater good of poorer members of the community. For example, the wives and daughters of the charter members figured quite prominently in the preparations for the great sanitary fair, which was held in 1864 to raise money for the care of soldiers wounded in the Civil War. The Bess Almond Society continued until 1906 when it asked to be taken over by Road of Shalom to ensure proper maintenance of the cemetery on Troy Hill. But the greatest accomplishment of this small group of young Jewish settlers in Pittsburgh and Allegheny City was the construction of the first synagogue building in Western Pennsylvania. I really wish we had the records from the board meetings when they were talking about that for the first time so that we could see how the idea developed and became a reality. But in fact, the location the founders chose for the building may be a big part of the reason why we don't have those records now. They chose a site downtown on Hancock Street, now 8th Street, very close to the Allegheny River so as to be walkable for the people who lived in Allegheny City and in Pittsburgh. But there was no flood control then, and the Allegheny swept the buildings in that first block away from the river quite regularly during the flood season in the spring and possibly destroyed the early documents that we'd love to have today. My, my records begin, the board records begin with the 1880s minutes, so I, I really wish I had from 1854 to 1880, but they may have been swept away in a flood. Well, that makes you wonder why the board remodeled that same building in 1888, and then tore it down and built a new building on the exact same site in 1901, still before flood control, but they did. They did, that's another story altogether. <laughs> So this drawing from 1900 is the only image we have of the first building. It was designed by the local architect, Charles Bartberger, who did a lot of church building also, and had a sanctuary and rooms for religious school and the expanding day school. In 1863, Isaac Mayer Wise in his newspaper, The Israelite, described the building as Byzantine in style, and he was very impressed that this was the product of a congregation of only 40 members. An impressive building is one thing, but more impressive to me is, as Wise noted, the strength of the small Jewish community that could support the building and its activities, religious and educational. While they were busy raising families, donating their time and money to community service, and contributing to the commercial and industrial development of what would become at one point the sixth largest city in the United States. I hope I've answered in part the questioning title Maida gave for this talk. Our charter members did what? And I want to leave you with a somewhat flowery quotation that I found while I was researching for another talk. These are the words of a young alumnus of the temple, Louis Isaacs, spoken at the dedication of the Fanny Edel Falk Memorial in 1912. He said, quote, the founders were few and weak from a worldly standpoint, but theirs was the faith that conquers obstacles and makes difficulties disappear. Tonight, this was in 1912, we reap what they sowed. Tonight, when so few veterans of, are left in our ranks, it must be a joy for all who love Road of Shalom to realize that here has arisen a new generation of faithful souls, many and strong, compared with the small company of the founders, a generation inspired by their loyalty and filled with zeal to continue the work they began." End quote. Thank you.